Bonjour à tous, je me présente, je m'appelle Tom Gola. Je suis Tom Gola. Je suis 19 ans et je suis comme il me travaille cette année. Je suis beaucoup intéressé à la pédagogie et à l'éducation. Dans cette vidéo, on va répondre à certaines questions. Tout d'abord, on va essayer de parler de comment j'ai été amené à choisir ce thème. Ensuite, je vais expliquer mes méthodes de travail et comment j'ai été amené à cette conclusion. On va parler Uh, how I was led to certain des, conclusions des and we will pretty much speak of the fundamental uh, goals of school réponse, uh, and as far as answers we uh, I will try and offer some alternative methods which I have um, which I will bring to you that are also inspired uh, by great pédagogues and after that I will uh, integrate uh, some uh, aspects some subjects which I think would be interesting uh, to uh, integrate in the the public Alors, school system so that children may have a more complete education. Euh, Before we start, I would like to read you a little text which I have recently written just so that mm. we can get started with that. Let me perhaps uh, 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 tell you in advance that it's quite a bit dark, it's a bit anarchist, and just so that everyone knows we will also speak about drug and sexuality, this is in a way perhaps to make everyone happy and to make sure I have more views on my video. The only comfort when I look at mankind are the youth. This youth Oui, Free cis. and independent. Le yes, I insist. The youth is more independent than you are, adult. With your craziness about organization and your dependences, both material, inhuman, and unreason. We dirt our own hands with fuel, corruption, and waste, and all other type of injustified violence. Do not pretend that nothing is happening. Open your eyes and find the taste for discovery and love which is all around us. Do not be ashamed of your feelings that good manners point to. We build with them and not against them. The human will not be able to be happy if it stops learning from what surrounds him. With knowledge of nature, mankind will be. When it will have banned its dependences by uh, in profit of healthy complementarity, please stop with your economic crisis and inventing credits to restart the machine. By indenting the use, it is your own pension that you are condemning. Certainly, Platon had already said about philosophy, but the science knows its subtlety within the context of the period it happens in. Why? is politics looking at shor such short term. Please let us leave a good earth to our children, but also good children to our earth. The word love will make sense once we will have stopped associating it with dependence. I feel this incapacity of loving despite desiring to do so. Please give me the strength and the will to be free and autonomous uh, despite a hierarchical society and relax knowledge through its perception. Effectively frustrated mankind consume. Frustrated from the understanding mankind owns. This is what our sensorial poverty has given birth to. We move away, we no longer understand each other. The human is probably the only animal who is that poor in terms of communication. Where are the cerebrated? Where is the man of humanism? Where is the, um, the power that will allow a fertile uh, earth for future generation? How is the world, why is the world only aggression? How can mankind have gone so low? Despite its illusions of greatness, it is poor in its heart, and worse, it knows so. He is aware of it and accepts it. He is comf comforted in this melodrama. He is satisfied, he is almost satisfied with injustice. Mankind becomes crazy because he no longer fills his body. Because he thinks too much, he never stops thinking, he's omnibulated by the mental. The individual is dissociated, identity no longer exists, we are no longer masters of our own persons. Human seeks in vain this unicity with the world through suffering and pleasure in order to try and give a birth to this body that he has forgotten the existence of. Darwin was right. The natural selection will make its own work. We are 
currently pulling on the string of the a trap that will close on ourselves. Uh, we are running straight into a wall and everyone pretends to ignore it while everyone knows it. Human is committing suicide. The human is accelerating its own race to the wall within which it's running to. By losing its sensitivity of our perceptions, we cut ourselves from the reality of the world. We are therefore become unable to live in harmony with our own environment, natural environment, and which is useless or destructive of a subtile equilibrium which we can no longer understand. The human is organizing its collective suicide. By too much thinking, judging, and dissociating, the human has become crazy. Is this disease hereditary? The mission of the 21st century is to take a turn to avoid the wall. The only way to make man sensitive and aware is to have a complete reform of education systems. Here's a search, a work, the work of an entire lifetime towards love and awakening through senses, through learning how to live the present moment here and now in a way that's free, autonomous and radiant. What has frustrated me in school is that when I was 12 years old, those that claim to be anarchist or against the system, I then realized they were actually inactive and not building anything. And this would make me crazy, so I never proclaimed myself to be an anarchist because I didn't have the feeling that I had sufficient um, alternatives that would be sufficiently coherent. And therefore I, asked my, I told myself, well, I have to work, I'm going to try and build something. I'm going to try and build something that may make things better because I am convinced that that is possible. Well, to start with, let me tell you why I chose this thing. Because I, as a student, was never truly integrated in a school. I changed school many times, and I often was in a situation of rupture with the school system. And all of the systems, without truly understanding them, I was never able to extract anything satisfactory from it. This was always it was always unpleasant for me to go to school, and I know that for many, uh, it remains unpleasant. I was lucky because I went for two years in a Rudolf Steiner school, and that is where uh, I got interested in pedagogy. Because to me, a professor was a head. It wasn't really a human with feelings. It was someone who knew everything. But when we look at the human, at a professor, we can find flaws and we can understand that they don't always uh, think what they're saying. And this is very important within education, and we'll see why later. So why did I choose this theme? Because we've all been students, or at least the majority of us have been students. And for the great majority, we are all mothers and fathers, and we will, or perhaps most of us will actually become so. The first thing... Uh, we'll see how I work. I have always tried to understand and work through experience. I am someone who reads very little, I am someone who um, talks a lot but also observes a lot. And I try to uh, extract conclusions or the majority of them through observation. I was also confronted to teaching. So what I did is I wanted to put myself in the place of the professor to see what it felt like and to try and see if I could do better or perhaps if I could add something. Therefore, I gave short classes within the Rudolf Steiner School and I thank my students if they're listening to me now. And I also went to conferences in universities on great pedagogues I met lots of people, including uh, so with social workers, social advisors, and I also did uh, quite a few trainings within um, kindergartens and Montessori kindergartens. Let's say that I was always in an objective of construction, of learning, of training every day, no matter what I was doing, I would observe and try and see what qualities would be developed within me and also within others. 
So this is why I chose pedagogy as a theme. And now uh, I will explain what my work methods were. Now we need to be in agreement with what the main objective, the fundamental objective of school is in the 21st century. I'm not speaking of the goals that we are fulfilling, but if we ask this question, if I ask you the question, what are the main goals of school? I will tell you what I think of that. Well, to me, we will speak of intelligence. Intelligence, the objective is to be intelligent. It's a vast term that regroups many, many things. And there is a definition by Gartner, who is a famous pedagogue, which I admire very much. And he speaks about different forms of intelligence, uh, linguistic intelligence, words, literature, for writers, poets, and we are mostly working in French language and in other languages. There is the logic, uh, mathematics, I don't need to draw that, everyone who likes physics, numbers, logic, reasoning. There is a kinesthetic intelligence, which is very interesting and very not very developed in public schools right now, which has to do with dancing, circus, sports, and we will see how they help develop a certain form of intelligence. There is the uh, visual special intelligence, which is somewhat developed in public school, although uh, through arts, but it should be uh, but more uh, manual work, architectural work should be integrated for this to be truly part of the school system, so that it may be more complete. And there is musical intelligence. Musical intelligence, again, I don't really need to you know, give a scheme to explain, it has to do with the sound, musicality, and the idea would be to play an instrument, but not necessarily singing is also part of that musical intelligence. And now there are two forms of intelligence which to me look at a resemble, so which is the interpersonal and the intrapersonal. Within the interpersonal we speak of relations, uh, relations and this is um, interesting because lots of my classes have to do with this because to me school one of the great objectives of school is to have social integration and we will see how school handles this the interpersonal has to do with the group whereas the intrapersonal is has to do with the individual and we will and I will again speak about a great theme which is one of the great goals of school which is autonomy we have spoken of objectives of intelligence of relational objectives and we have spoken about autonomy and we will afterwards I will finish with different forms of intelligence and then go to the last form of intelligence is naturalist, and we will see how different subjects, such as gardening, observing nature, video, observing fauna and flora, will allow us to best develop this naturalist intelligence. Here are the objectives. I will repeat them now so that they may be clear. Uh, relational objectives, uh, affective objectives, autonomy, uh, uh, an objective of intelligence, and I want to say an objective of reasoning and concentration, which I will describe in more details later. Why reasoning and concentration? Well, I think we'll go straight into the subject now, and for this, I need to speak to you about students. Within education, there are three people, the student, the parent and the professor. I will brush a quick painting of this. The student in the 21st century cannot be taught as students were being taught 20 years ago. Why? Because with the appearance of internet, and I will speak more specifically of this great search engine that is Google, we can type all sorts of questions and have answers to everything. And so people are saying, why, what, what is school for? Because Google has an immediate answer. And also because of social network, we are now able to interact with one another, so everything that is effective is actually solved. We therefore not understand why we're going to school because internet gives us everything. I will speak more of internet later and we will see what its lacks and limits are and what it creates in terms of the child development. And more scientifically, we will look 
in the brain what the various evolutions it may create in the brain because it does create changes in the brain. The youth are not learning as they were 20 years ago. The parents, well, the parents are working more. Uh, we are in a consuming society. Um, we are in an economical crisis, it must be said. The parents work a lot. The parents come and pick up their children much later in school. And lots of the uh, tasks that belong to the parents before are now in the hands of education. Education must bring things which before were naturally given by families within a uh, relation, family relational framework. Now school has to answer to more needs, and I will also speak of it later if I have time. The professor, the professor the typical professor is about half a century old. I have in my career as a student I had many professors, some fantastic ones and some poorer ones. And I would try to perhaps raise a portrait of what is a good professor. And we will look later in, when we look at methods and types of subject studies, how we can improve things. Professors, for the most part, are half a century old. They're 50 years old. If they're 50 years old, do they truly have a knowledge of the upcoming generation? Despite their experiences. That's one of the Ça, great questions I will raise and to which I will not answer immediately. To start with, we've already started. We've already looked at work, the work methods I have taken on for my project. We have looked at the fundamental objectives of school, why I have chosen this theme. I've also chosen this theme because it is a vast theme, one that allows me to have an ensemble view of the human and to speak of different themes. I will now speak of my strong ideas and the methods which I, whom, which I think we should use. The first method in um, includes understanding children through two main knots. These two knots will work throughout life and it is important to build them solidly from a young age and that the professor be aware of these two knots so they may balance them. What are they? They are, in reality, something which speaks to everyone, I think, the zone, the comfort zone and the action zone. When one is young, when one is small, one is naturally curious, but we are uh, more concerned with this comfort zone and we will try and look at balance to see if someone is too sure of themselves or not enough. We'll try and manage this the best we can, this equilibrium. And again, this is a case by case. There is not a fixed theory. One must always adapt to the context to the situation and to each child. So the security knot, the security space uh, for the child who is perhaps more fearful, who needs a passion, who needs affection, and who also needs limit. Uh, I often have discussions with my young cousin who is eight years old, and who all of a sudden, when he's unable to easily communicate, we will speak of communication later, he becomes uh, uh, not himself. Uh, I will use this big word, I'm not sure this will mean to yourself, but I feel like he disincarnates. I feel that he becomes disrespectful, and one can see that he's going through a hard time. And so how can we do with that? Well, after having a number of discussions with him, which I saw that weren't working, perhaps he only needs someone who sets a limit, which is why sometimes I got quite angry with my cousin. I took him aside. I didn't shout at him, but I said quite strongly, I said, this is not right. This is completely disrespectful. It makes me sad to see you like that. And I'm also sorry that you're not going through an easy time. He didn't like this, but... He took it very personally um, and was wondering what was going on. So I gave him a little time to think about it. And the next day I asked him, do you know why I said that? And he said, yes, I know why you said that. And I said, do you think it helps you to do that? And then he, he waited just a minute and he said, yes, I think it helps me. So we both knew that this may not have been the best method, 
the, the best way to react in face of, when facing this situation. Nevertheless, it clearly shows that the child needs affection, but it also needs, it also needs limits, and this has to do with the comfort zone. We will Mais now speak of this other, the second uh, knot, the uh, action uh, zone, um, the question of discovery, uh, exiting one's comfort zone to go towards discovery, which is also essential to learning. With a small child, we we'll, won't need to work as much on this knot, because if this comfort zone is well respected, it will naturally be curious and go for things. And he won't need um, uh, encouraging in this way. On the contrary, as an adolescent, once the child it is not always the case, but if this child has well developed, we will put more of a emphasis on this discovery area since he is now um, reassured in his comfort zone. So we'll try to push him to take him further um, with uh, outside of his limits and to see what he's able for his own good, for his personal personal pride and for his own development. How to feed this not this, this discovery zone? Well, we will see that with all of the methods and the subjects of classes which I propose. The first thing to say... The first thing to say is that we must educate sensorially. Many pedagogues will tell you so, even if they are old, such as Montaigne or Steiner, Freinet, Garner, whom we spoke earlier with multiple intelligences, they will all speak about this desire of learning through senses. I will now explain to you how I was able to observe this veracity in schools. I have seen that in public school what would make me crazy, sad, what would truly shock me is that most children would sit on a chair for their entire childhood. Of course I'm exaggerating, of course they have pauses, they have other activities, but I feel that we leave them sitting and thinking for too long where they're not necessarily ready for that. A child needs to move, to dance, to discover, to observe, and this is how he or she will have a true knowledge of the world and will build him or herself. And, and it makes me laugh because one sees these students, these small children who are at the desk and once the teachers start talking, they are unable to remain concentrated, they are drawing on their desks. And this is a, a good way to show how creative they are and how much they need to create and move within space. What is he doing on his chair? He's building a paper plane, a way to move through space relationally. He's curious. He's going to write notes on post-its and pass them on left and right. The child will develop if one gives him the freedom to do so. But if we stigmatize him in letting him sit on a chair all day, I believe we're making a mistake. And this is how we see um, what in youth I will call um, mental alienation. That was a big word, let me explain it. Well, according to me, what it means is that because we do not stimulate students enough through their senses, they become overexcited. What happens, or fall asleep. What happens in both cases, whether we're falling asleep or overexcitement, is that we lose contact with our senses, the link of reality with the world that surrounds us. Problem. Of course problem. it's a problem. Ah, oui, problem. How can we Quand expect a child to develop si pas, if he or she doesn't uh, have a reality si with the world and process. we don't allow them to Donc, develop their own senses? So learning through theory, Pourquoi why not? I mean, there are some academic subjects for which is necessary, but it must make sense. And this means that we must have classes through practice to vary one's methods. We saw the different forms of intelligence. And if, for instance, a professor says something Thing. It has to be explained perhaps differently afterwards so that uh, to make sure the child has learned. If we ask you a question, do not repeat the exact same thing. Try and frame it differently, please. A key theme of classes, so that they may be lively, so that there may be interest, so that the subject you are teaching may be lively and interesting, so that children may take pleasure in coming to classes, is rhythm. The rhythm of a class is something truly important. I have often observed that when we come out of the pause, we just get back to work, but we're actually still talking about what we'll do later, what we just did in the break, or what we're planning to do. 
But in Rudolf Steiner's course, before the class, there is a type of a, part, a word or some words. Uh, you know this, if you're a Steiner student, you know what these words are. What do these words, this, this poem allows? It allows to center oneself, to realize that the break is over and that we're getting into a learning vibe. And I think this is great. I was able to observe a real change in me um, in my way of uh, uh, getting classes just with this. And we also have some rhythmic uh, uh, moments within uh, Rudolf Steiner schools, or maybe a child who comes and presents uh, um, a poem he, he or she has written, and this allows for uh, self assurance, but also a dynamic with the students, which is quite interesting. And also during the class, please, I have so many awful memories of uh, history classes on Friday afternoons when the the teacher spoke in such an autonomous way, in a way that was absolutely so horrific, and you are certain that you will get everyone to sleep within five minutes, and I remember turning to the clock, and I probably turned to the clock 200 times within one class. How to make classes more interesting? Well, it's simple. You have to uh, break monotony. Et ça, c'est pas compliqué. Il suffit par exemple de changer de ton à un moment. Par exemple, je vous ai ramené à la réalité. Oh, voilà. up by clapping one voilà. hand and voilà. I brought you back to reality, or perhaps creating a silence, a break, a pause. Voilà. Here you go. This pause, I made it so that even those who were falling asleep, we've broken the monotony and they're back in the room with their senses. Or it could be through moving through spaces. A, prof, a teacher that gets up, that gets closer to a teacher, that uh, acts uh, what he's saying with his hands, that draws on the blackboard. And what is also important in the rhythm of a class? Uh, well, I can show the beginning and the end are truly interesting. Very often what we see is that they're doing exercise, and all of a sudden, okay, it's time to come, it has bell, well, just okay, everybody leaves, okay, and you're on work, okay, they're going to do this too, and up, and that's the end of it. And I, I want to say that this is absolutely wrong. What could be done, what should be done at the end of the class, is to take five minutes to sympathize and to see what the teachers have understood of the class. Perhaps a bit of an evaluation of the knowledge of what was grabbed out of the class through a discussion, for, for instance. But mostly, just before you leave, we must leave the class on an open question. Why? So that curiosity may come back. So that the following time, the following class, the students may come back with a question in their hand, a question to which they will think and perhaps even answer. And to end the class with a question allows for questioning to happen in the head. And even though we don't consciously think about it, perhaps the next day we will actually think, oh, well, the teacher asked that question. And what I think is that this could be an answer to it. And I believe that this, in terms of the reason of the class, is absolutely essential. Um, I think I am done with the rhythm of the class and we will move on to the next theme, which is everything that has to do with suggestions and questioning. This is a theme that will take us some time. It's a very interesting one to so that we can develop it the best we can. Okay, see you later. I have left you with suggestion and questioning. Why speak about that? Well, first of all, because I was able to observe that within small children, they naturally question others. It wasn't something special, it was something that was just part of the class. Whereas in bigger classes, I think that, unfortunately, because of others' judgment, uh, among other things, but also because of professors, we are not necessarily, we don't necessarily want to ask questions because we are afraid to slow down the class. And most of the time, we know that if we ask a question, the teacher will repeat exactly the same thing he or she had already said, and this would not help us understand anything. So again, let's move back to always changing your teaching methods about when teaching a single thing. How to to make it, to allow for students to keep asking questions. Well, the first thing would be to encourage them, to tell them that without questions we cannot build, but whereas with questions we can allow for things to advance. So if we want to 
you know, if you do a question, it's not that you have an understanding, it's that you wish for a subject to move forward. There are many things which we think we understand, but we actually do not go deep into the subject, which is why questioning is so important. Why am I speaking about questioning? Who asks the question? The professor. Who answers the question? Usually the students but very often the teacher. En fait, l'idéal, ce serait que ce so the ideal would be for students to ask the questions and for the students to answer the questions, de, whereas the teacher, ideally, would bring the children to raise questions and also, through suggestion, bring the children to guess a potential answer. Teaching must be a game. Steiner would say that the I is developed through playing. Très important. Euh, very important. À malheureusement, In school, souvent, unfortunately, very often, teachers ask questions that the students Alors, wouldn't naturally ask themselves. So how to have this coherence and this reality, um, il faut les laisser, en fait, we la must et le let temps them de and let give chose. them the time and the curiosity to discover coup, things so that question. they, students, will ask the question and therefore there will be a process of questioning. But what I see is that in primary school, the youth do not necessarily, do not necessarily know why they're studying. They're there and they're imitating without asking questions. When I ask them what is school for, they say, they either answer well to please my parents or to find a job later. And I feel that we've missed a great step because when we speak about education, we speak of construction so that one can handle oneself as an individual and to then be free to problem. choose what one wishes. Problem. problem. Very big problem. On va revenir sur la suggestion we will and now go back to suggestion and questioning. We will go back to question and suggest, suggestion and questioning later. In order to speak of this theme now, um, I have to say that su to suggest an answer is an art. And the teacher must always bring the student to perceive this as a game and to have a, a logic of uh, reasoning. I would like to speak a bit of uh, objectives. We've spoken about the objectives of school. I would like to also speak of the brain, how the brain works in regards to objectives. I'm repeating myself, I'm enough. The objective of school, we've seen so. But I think we must also have an individual objective. I will now um, go down heavy on you. We often see in school uh, teachers, uh, students uh, cheating. Do you know why students teach, cheat? Well, mostly because school places very much the accent on success, uh, grades, rather than knowledge. And that is what the problem is, very simply said. What do grades create? They create this type of thing. Oh, there were, there, were, there were homework. Oh my God, was it, was it graded? Oh, give, me your, give me your paper, I will copy it. Bravo. Vous avez Great, you really suggested, fantastic. Uh, everyone's copying because what matters is the grade. When the kids receive their grades, they won't even look at what has been corrected. They would only look at the grade and then it's done, except for those who are truly interested in actual learning. And, and that means that we're not feeding them enough. We must feed them with curiosity. We must encourage them. What do grades create? Grades create something I do not really like. They create hierarchy. From a very young age, we install claimants of hierarchization. Whereas school, one of the main objectives of school should be autonomy. By creating this hierarchy and this climate of dominant and dominated, we're going against the independent development of individuals. We are saying that we need a stronger, that we know we need someone stronger, and the stronger needs someone weaker, and it is some type of a, a very uh, negative spiral. One more thing, we speak of uh, individualized objectives. There is an average, and there are those who are above and those 
were below it. And this again creates an hierarchy, as we've said. But the objective is for everyone to be average. The teachers are bothered by students who are too bright that they cannot uh, bring forward anymore, or the average one, or the, the, the lower students which are not able to bring to an average. What they want is to have everyone average. And this is what school wants. But the human hasn't actually understood that the strength of every species, and we can see that with the nature, it's complementarity. Complementarity of plants, for instance, they are complementary of one another. They're always bringing something to other plants and taking something from others. But what we try to do is to put everyone in one line with this climate of dominant dominator. And how to change this? Well, it would be, I think, through uh, individualized objectives. For every child to have a tutor, and everyone says, well, it's not possible, it's too expensive, but we'll speak later of the financial aspect. What is truly important for the development of individuals is that they may be able to set some initial objectives with a tutor. I find this is quite elementary, and this will also allow them. I thought that there would be my school a multitude of subjects and that most of them should be um, facultative so that everyone could learn uh, based on their interests. There are some scientific research that say that when the brain learns to interest, it develops a greater potential than what it can uh, reach. We only use a very small part of, my, of our brains, but if we learn with interest, then we are stimulating connections that wouldn't exist otherwise. In other ways, grades, format, and create hierarchy, whereas personal objectives build, allow people to be free, and renders people as independent. This is in terms of a personalized objective. I'm now done with great methods, my great, my big, my large, basic, uh, fundamental ideas. So they're about uh, facultative classes, no grades, individual projects, um, and um, um, peer support, and, uh, and it is important to speak about all of these issues, and I think I will directly move forward to the uh, classes themes. What is the first subject I teach? The first subject I teach is communication. So you tell me, but why is it the first class you give, Tom? Why do you not simply teach French or, or math like everyone else? And I will read you a mini extract of something I have recently written. Uh, it's something you'll be able to look at. It's me, it's what I think of. Communication is a vast theme. Why teach communication? Because a bad communication is at the source of all existing problems. I've always asked myself why all religions speak of love and peace, why all politics speak about fraternity and equality, why everyone is looking for freedom and happiness. And despite that, mankind has never stopped uh, making war on earth to impose ideas who very often are the same ones despite being formulated diversely. I will now give you a minute to think about that. Why is communication essential? I will now give you the example with my young cousin that I spoke of earlier, but also in the daily life. As a student, for instance, if, there was, if a student has a bad communication with their teacher, it is obviously already a gain for its learning process and its uh, personal development, especially because if we go through communication, this becomes a lot easier rela um, in terms of uh, relations, whether with family, girlfriends, friends, buddies. But also on a from a professional point of view, uh, this is a criteria which is socially re uh, searched for, is for in most most jobs is to be comfortable with communication. So I think this is a basic and elementary fundamental subject to be taught from a young age. And everyone says, well, communication is something complex. 
We must have some knowledge. Moi, je dis, je and I said that I start with the nonverbal, within, with what is ludique, hein, within the body, because it's something quite hard to teach, to teach and it's something that students de, often appreciate théâtre, as we do so minimes, through exercises of theater or miming, and we understand through observing, and this has less to do with the mental, and they realize that they will apply these methods very quickly in their daily life with an objective of, uh, of um, uh, good doing. Et, uh, And this, I think, is great. I will not go much more into details on this subject. I have briefly said why I think it's a beneficiary, but if you'd like me to do a video only on this class and to explain how I develop this class or how I give this class, so whether I can make a tutorial or something, please do not hesitate to do a, uh, leave a comment uh, below the video and I will make another tutorial for this. Or a video for this. The second class I give is about the world of image, but when I speak of the world of image, I'm speaking in a very fast way, I'm speaking of photography, because I have observed that many youth like to do photography, this is also why I find it interesting to teach, but also because we are at a time where we are absolutely bombarded with publicity, absolutely everywhere, we're often sitting in front of screens, we are currently bombarded with images. Il faut savoir que And les we yeux uh, must know that our eyes represent about 80% of sensory captures, which is why it's truly important exemple, to manage it well. We speak of publicity, we speak of manipulation, we will try and see how photos are manipulated in order to manipulate us and to make us believe in vital needs when they're only expressing secondary needs. With photographs, we will also go observe um, nature, and this will allow for more uh, detailed reports that have, could be a parallel with um, uh, other classes. And I will now speak of younger children, for all the ones who speak of photography, but for younger children, if we tell them what a leaf width is, um, it's one thing, but if they go outside and if any, he or she finds a leaf and he looks at it and he turns it around, he will look at the shape, the structure, um, he will touch it, uh, test its resistance, because everything happens through touching. The small children touch everything and taste everything. And to go in a forest and walk around, they will acquire a lot more than, um, than by just uh, hearing about things which they can't really picture. This is more or less in terms of the world of images. I would like to make a short parallel. The world of images allows for better observation, and that is something that is useful in all domains. And when I say all domains, I mean all domains. And this is something we will cut, um, because it's not interesting. And so we'll now move on to the next chapter. I will do a bit of a transition. In the world of images, one sees many uh, women uh, with the little clothes on, This, all this to attire Alors, women. But I want to say, feminists, uh, please wake up. And I'm not talking about hysterical feminists. I'm talking about feminists who ask for a real equality because there is lots of work to do. And I feel everyone would be advantaged by that. Even men would um, take advantage in having true equality. And I'm convinced of that. To once again exit these um, relations of dominant dominated and to be able to have uh, honest relations with everyone. I'm sorry, I will not go out of the window. I have a nest of um, bees in my room, and this uh, sometimes disturbs the work I do. So where was I? Here we go. I wanted to make a link between photography in order to speak about our relational, sexual, and affective relations, whether in an autonomous manner or in a group manner. This is an enormous chapter of my work. I'm sorry, I will make it take another break now. 
Voilà, j'en étais resté sur la communication relationnelle, et relational education. Pourquoi c'est si important so d'aborder ce sujet bah, Tout simplement well, parce qu'avec observation, observing, j'ai pu voir des propos très, to, uh, très sexistes dans les cours de récré. J'ai pu voir une séparation assez nette avec les filles de mon âge, de 6 et 8 ans. Et je sais, en fait, de comprendre pour moi, c'est la manière dont on traite l'éducation dans les écoles. Et je pense que ça a à voir avec la façon dont nous éduquons nos enfants Matters of sexuality. Uh, bon, je I think there is not enough of sexual education, and secondly, I think these courses do not fulfill their duty. It's like this contradiction between um, grades and wanting to lead to voilà, autonomy. Well, there, in this um, relational affective and sexual education, lots of prevention is done with young children, and I think prevention is very important. I'm the first to say that there are STDs out there, and you need to protect yourself. But one thing that's for sure, is sure is that a child is actually starting to own his own body as he evolves. So he or she is not necessarily uh, sure of her herself, is not entirely built, and he's already being... Um, Um, safeguarded between the others' body. We're speaking about prevention, prevention, prevention. And who says prevention says fear? We're preventing you, we're telling you to be careful. And I think prevention and fear should be um, the country of affective relations who should be something sweet, respectful, something that has to do with pleasure and something that's truly healthy. And du coup. I am therefore dissatisfied with how these subjects are being taught. Moi, je pense que ce qu'il faudrait faire, c'est un cours que j'ai malheureusement pas encore eu le temps de donner. I think that what should be done, and this is the class I haven't had a chance to give, yes, it shouldn't be about an old nurse coming from the hospital and saying, oh, you need to put a condom on, and this is what your sexual organ looks like to a boy and a girl. I think there truly be, there should truly be a discussion. We're speaking about small children now, but even with adolescents, there should be a young nurse, and I think it's important that this discussion should take place between young people, and I think a male nurse is also interesting because he can bring some reasonings on more specific issues and to truly speak about uh, its sexuality in a free way because this subject that, yes, is discussed but that remains a bit of taboo in our societies this day. But I think that for children and for young adolescents, we are um, making adolescents and children fear the other's body and they have to go through their own experiences and their own discoveries and we will speak later of pornography and how the media and publicity, internet and everything else are influencing children and how it is creating a completely false relations, a false image of um, affective relations. And I think this is a subject that needs to be discussed and that should evolve throughout the 21st century. So this is in a way something that I wanted to bring to you. I also wanted to say something about group versus individual. We're speaking about individual, we're speaking about groups, we speak of autonomy. Autonomy is the key word of, school, of the school I would like to create today. I think autonomy is the basis of what schools should bring, the group. It is very important for a group so that there be a good correlation between a group. First, to have personalized objectives, as I said earlier, but there's another concept that should be brought in. In schools, for instance, in public schools, if someone starts um, acting out and throwing stuff at the teacher, he will be considered like a hero. Um, other children will think he's a hero, he's a rebel, he's thinking different uh, differently and th diversity yeah, makes it so contre, that a person will be adored but in a Rudolf Steiner school or in a free si uh, children's coup, summer hill school it's even more um, obvious because if the child starts acting out or doing something silly he will be badly looked at by other children um, thinking that he doesn't have a personal objective or that he doesn't have he keeps us from doing our work or he doesn't think it's part of the 
market as he's not respecting the group. And there's a new concept that ça, comes in is that we're working together rather than against. And I believe that it's truly important. Si and I am convinced that students would be a lot more comfortable if they et, could share et, what et they feel and if they could share with others uh, through uh, presentations. And I think this works really well in starter schools that everyone does a presentation on a certain theme and presents it to others and to do so in a more regular way and on different subjects in different classes to say that I will look into this subject and I will teach others, I will share with others. This develops communication, it also develops the interest that we have in one another and the fact that it is constructive to work together. L'éducation, education, uh, affective, relational education. Ouais, well, pour, I will stop si here on this matter, but if you want nouveau, more uh, details again cours, on all of the cours, um, si, subjects si that I'm looking at, I could do a more specific video if you want to, so do not hesitate to leave Ensuite, a commentary below uh, the video. Uh, now, uh, the course I'm giving, well, I will speak very briefly. Well, it's actually not a course I've given. The arts of circus, dance, and sports. Again, we are talking of effective education with the body being transformed. And I think that when the body transforms itself at adolescence, it is truly important to practice not necessarily all three things, but at least one of them, either dancing, circus, the arts of circus, or sports. Why? Because these develop um, uh, subtleness, equilibrium, balance, and physical strength. And it allows to better understand one's body, one's body, to better know one's body, and to own one's body as it's developing. Um, and I think this is truly important, especially since, as we said, the child who will need to move, the adolescence also needs this. And the objective, for instance, I think that is very well represented in sports, where a complicated that will be an objective that may be too complicated will result in discouraging and failure, whereas a too simple an objective will actually be disappointing because it's too simple. And I think with true sports, one can manage to have coherent uh, objectives based on one's capacity, ability, and one's motivation. So I think this is uh, a way to better understand personal objectives. I would like to also speak of mechanics. Mechanics is something I truly like, and I truly like it because I think it develops many things. It allows to put in practice everything that is theoretical, whether math or physics or the thermal resistance of a candle or the uh, rate of tightness um, in Newton terms of a, a screw in an engine. I mean, this may, this may be Chinese word, but this actually makes a lot of sense for me. When you dismantle something, for instance, a two-time uh, scooter engine, then we'll have all these pieces and it, it requires a great methodology. One requires patience, one has to deduct things, it requires autonomy. Me. And, it and it also Alors, results in a certain satisfaction once the engine car, starts again. And when I speak of mechanics, I also mean electricity, de, de uh, plumbing, uh, house um, building. Pour moi, I think all of this teaches how uh, a way out of trouble. And there is a way to become, and it also teaches autonomy as one becomes lots of, um, a lot more autonomous if one is able to fix their own things. So I think uh, these are subjects that need to be taught. I think in a faculty, uh, it doesn't have to be mandatory because I don't think everyone would like it, but it's something valid. Um, I would like to also voyage. speak of traveling. Le voyage, traveling is something important. absolutely super, important. Super, super important. Very, very, very important for development. Uh, luckily, I was very lucky. As very young, I had many opportunities to travel, to go on many continents, and I had fabulous experiences with that. But let's speak of a more specific uh, 
Qu'est-ce qui est spécifique au voyage en bateau um, the, the bah, boat L'avantage trip. du voyage en bateau, What's c'est specific que, about a boat trip? Disons, well, a boat trip uh, allows to truly work on many forms of intelligence. First of all, it's great, it's fantastic. I think everyone would have a great time taking a boat trip, but it also requires a good management of the group, of the schedule, of responsibilities. Um, youth are given responsibilities, and it also allows to apply in practice everything that is done theoretically. For instance, in physics, the strengths of magnets, in geography, how to read a map, in biology, one could dive and go and look at maritime biology, but also that is technical, architectural, in terms of how a boat is built, and also navigation methods. It teaches how to read a compass, all these things which I think are extremely basic and that are truly fabulous in a boat trip. And I would like to thank uh, in front of the camera the Gallinelli family who have permitted me to uh, take many trips on their boat. I also wanted to speak about many, many things, but I would try to be as brief as possible because I would like this video to be short. Many people have asked me to do a uh, course on a ha- on health and medicine. What is more vast than a course on health and medicine? I think everyone is preoccupied with oneself. I mean, or at least I hope so to some extent. And with the current rhythms of living, we don't have much time. Um, we're eating stuff for without knowing where it comes from, without knowing what it is, and we we'll just um, eat it without knowing more about it. So we will go through nutrition, um, sleep. We can look into the brain for everything that are psychological diseases, uh, which includes many diseases. We will speak of many things in this course, and I could again make a more detailed course on this issue. And if there is a request in this field, is because I think there is a will to know ourselves better. So I will now bounce on something different. When I went to do um, a meeting in the Paidos organization in Geneva, who recuperates youth who are in a school rupture, a uh, social rupture, they try to understanding themselves better through what they call autoportrait. This has to do, it's an introspective work, a long-term introspective work, which means that most, uh, how can I say it, the schedule, most of the time, they do a self-portrait and introspection. The, uh, the self-portrait could be a drawing. Um, well, I remember when I did my first self-portrait, and I'm not very good in art, but when I did my first self-portrait, it was something truly intimate, so true discovery. It took me about a month, and about a month I started liking my drawing, and I started liking how to draw, and it wasn't the case before that. Self-portrait it could be vast, it could be a drawing, but it could also be uh, a video to introduce oneself, to say who one is. It could be a written work, it could be uh, a work of art. It could be any of those things. Art. Well, I think that art and manual work and everything that goes through mechanics is something that is not enough developed with you. I know people who go out at night Uh, Adolescents, they go out at night with masks and they go and graph uh, and do graffitis on wall and they're arrested by police and then they're told it's their fault. But what I think is that the youth, these young people, were not given a chance to express themselves enough. Why wouldn't we leave them in school a white wall where they can renew their work? Why not develop the artistic aspect of uh, more in schools? And I think this would solve many of these types of problem, especially since those that tag outside, that do graffitis outside, are true actors who are actually realizing amazing frescoes, which I find beautiful. There you go. I also wanted to speak briefly of procrastination. It is something that I was able to observe quite a bit within adults. And it is not something I see within children. The children do not procrastinate. They don't, they only, they don't think of tomorrow. They think of now, now, now. What they think of is now. It is impossible for them to think later. Even young children, I mean, they cannot even think of 10 minutes later. They cannot think of very long uh, periods of time. And therefore, I asked myself, how could we remove this... Um, 
harmful phenomena through the development of children. Well, what I think is that simply school has to go to the end of this reasoning on the matter. Uh, with everything that we've said, I think we've already seen quite a few tools that could take away this habit. Mankind, through learning, at a certain point, uh, school will not take uh, uh, a child a person all the way to, to where he has to go. They have a grade, they look at their grade, and that's the end of it. But if you learn uh, animal names in German, for instance, do you know those animals? No, may you may not. So these, has, these animals need to be looked at, for instance, in biology, so that you can go all the way through a process. In mechanics, for instance, if you don't go all the way to the end of a process, then your engine won't start. It, it starts or it doesn't start. And I think that in school we have to find some some type of finality, some type of uh, achievement in our subjects, so that they're not just classes which, in the end, do not manage to reach an end in themselves, even if it's just a step. For instance, I'm interested in pedagogy, but I know that at the end of this initial work, I won't stop here. I will try to keep digging and to better understand this subject. I mean, this is obviously this seems quite obvious to me. And here's what I want to say in terms of progress as far um, about progress. I'm now reaching the end of my presentation, nevertheless. I wanted to speak a bit more about internet and social networks. I spoke about them briefly at the beginning of my presentation. Internet uh, gives an illusion, the illusion of a totality to mankind. What one must know is that one is faced with social networks or a computer, we have access to all the information, and that is pretty important because the human needs to understand everything. Uh, the man, human, mankind will always be heard, and this is also central for um, human beings. When they publish something, they are certain that someone will see it, and he or she will never be alone. Because it's true. I mean, internet, I mean, in the 21st century, I doubt that there will be one person at a time on the internet. Even now, while I'm speaking to you, we don't know how many people are on the internet, but I think it's a huge number, astronomical number. Well, what the problem, what, what's, what's the problem with that? Well, I think it's that we fall asleep sensorially. For instance, when you're watching this video, you know what you're watching, but you may not know what you're feeling, you don't know whether you're hot, you're cold, you are not linked to the world, you are are only linked with a number of pixels and an image that's you know coming out of nowhere. So here you go. The problem is that from a very young age, people are confronted to these issues, and they have very little sensorial development. They're only identified to themselves. They're only and rather or ident they identify with who looks at them. This could be very positive, and I'm sure there are positive examples. But this could also be very harmful, and it could create dependencies. Because if someone thinks I don't want to build myself, I want to build myself through a character in a video that I identify with, and I'm speaking about video, but I could also speak of reading. I think we can also escape the way um, I'm describing within reading, through reading. And what is important in what I'm saying is that it, it is sensorially that um, education is done through observation, through touching, and through the other senses, all of the other senses. I think this will be the end word, but before anything else, I would like us to think about a few questions in order to pursue this work. Please do not hesitate to ask your questions in commentaries. I'm sorry for cutting you off, but I've forgotten a very important theme. For this future school, this future school that I'm dreaming of and which principles I've explained, I think it should be defined. Everyone says it's quite a, a utopist uh, uh, um, approach to just propose classes and sub subjects in a public school. So, then I, but, so we should do it in a private school, but if we go to private schools, we're moving moving um, to, again, this higher position because it's private schools are expensive and we are back into the schemes of dominant dominating. And this, uh, to me, is truly a problem because is this school I'm talking about, is it abstract, is it a, a utopy, will it never uh, come to life because it's a utopy, it's a dream?
And what I told myself is that the child and the young adolescent, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, the only thing that they want is autonomy. That's the only thing they want. But they cannot because they have fears and they're not given the keys and the power to be autonomous. And what we need is we need a school to do that. And we will now speak of autonomy in, ter in financial terms. If the child has an acre of forest where he can go and cut wood to warm himself up, and this could have, could have to do with how to pay one school, if uh, a student uh, cultivates its own fields for all of the lunches, this could also be deducted from school fees. If there is a tax deduction from being in, one, in a school of this type, um, we would, and uh, we would therefore have a school that would be a lot less elitist because it would be a lot less expensive. And I think this project will take shape. And the end word is that I trust mankind and its abilities. Uh, very recently, I um, was able to look at the chef uh, the end of school project in Rudolf China School for the 12th class uh, of the Rudolf China School in Geneva. And I saw some hallucinating work, amazing stuff that the best uh, workers in the world could have done, incredible uh, projects and, and, and plays that uh, could have been done by professional artists. And I think these youth, these young people, were given the keys to exploit their full potential. And this reassures me immensely the fact that the human is able to show this potential and that they're not necessarily in this path of dominant dominated because I think school underestimates children and I think this underestimation also leads to alienation and a lack of, 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 of esteem in oneself, which is the contrary of autonomy. So the end word is that I trust and I trust that this school will one day take form. I still have to bail myself. I need for my methods to be clearer, more concrete. But honestly, I really am trustful. I would like to thank everyone who has helped me through this work, all the people I've met, my two uh, social counselors who have brought me a lot, my logopedist who has brought me a lot, and many other people who have truly helped me in this work with references, with contacts, and mostly I would like to thank my intuition to have taken the time that has led me to take the time to observe and to try and understand in a way that was different than just sitting on a school bench. Here you go. Thank you very much.